This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Have you been in touch with your local drug dealer? Not for ages, actually, no. I'm trying to take a break. Does Adam Bant know anybody that I could hit up? Well, it's a good question. We would have seen his tweet going around where he says, Mm -hmm. and I quote, yearly reminder, (laughs) this every year we must be reminded, (laughs) that drug dealers aren't to blame for your loved ones' banned drug-related problems. Quite the opposite. Dealers often act as community elders, keeping an eye out for regulars (laughs) and providing a stigma-free community connection point. Um, I mean, where's the lie? To be honest, I don't feel, I never feel judged or stigmatized by my drug dealer whenever I talk to him. I mean, that's like, honestly, it's not, but like (laughs) the the idea that people would genuinely believe that this is a tweet from Adam Bant, leader of the Australian (laughs) Greens, is fascinating. Incredible. So where did it come from? Well, oh, okay. So obviously they've actually lifted whoever made this fake tweet from Adam Bant, which by the way, I hear was went so far, this fake tweet, that Reuters fact check was contacting Adam's office, <laughs> asking him to verify whether he made that tweet. That's the fucking world we live in. Like I don't that's also, yeah, makes me feel quite uh Sad about the state of our fact checkers, but anyway. <laughs> Simpson, where are we on that bad drug dealer tweet? Damn it. On my it, desk, my fu- there's a real? deadline. I just can't The tell. papers go to print. <laughs> yeah. No, it was not an Adam Bant tweet. They lift, but it's a real tweet. It's a real tweet lifted from an account. So Katie Hornshaw, who is a harm reduction advocate, uh, a senior journalist with AOG Media Watch. She's an ambassador for Smart Recovery AU. She's a psychology graduate. She actually seems to, I looked at her account, she seems to have, you know, quite a lot of good stuff about drug harm reduction. And in the context of the other work that she is doing, it kind of makes sense. I do think there's an interesting conversation to be had about like continuing to criminalize (laughs) or vilify dealers who are a lot of the time just like poor people and marginalized people turning to the only job that they can kind of have and they're not always sure. evil and whatever. But obviously it's not a tweet that Adam would make. And get this is, <laughs> and, and this account, so Katie Hornshaw, she saw that this was being spread around under Adam's name and she quote yeah. tweeted it and said, behold, my life's biggest honour, my tweet selected by the ultra right as a sure bet to induce n- teeth gnashing from the brethren. What higher prize could I attain? Yes. She said, at Adam Bant, I hope being falsely linked to my words wasn't too horrifying smiley face wink face oh my god i noticed they cut it off her original tweet has blame prohibition at the end of course as in because that yes, makes it slightly more reason- political it's point. tying it yeah. to an actual policy yeah <laughs> no instead it's just there's nonsense i mean yeah if you really wanted to make people believe that it was an adam tweet surely you would include that so that it's like well that's green's policy isn't it to you know decriminalize yes, that's something we do and of course, the joy was not just Reuters, but the avalanche of Labour's drips tweets or people who wanted, who just wanted this tweet to be true, to be tweeted by the leader of the Greens, getting very excited and saying, no, how could he? How could he? <laughs> Did you see the I saw um, an account that I follow at Salem's underscore thought <laughs> tweeted? <laughs> Uh, a post apparently also by Adam Bant where he says, some people find tattoos to be attractive. For me, it's quite the opposite. The settled science on body modification is that it is directly linked to mental illness, STDs, low socioeconomic status, poor education and high risk behaviours, including drug and alcohol abuse. And Salem's thought said, oh, oh no, Adam, why? Why would you tweet that? <laughs> it's too easy, everyone. It's too easy. Ding, 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 ding. We start by using their words and then we start using their ideas and then we start putting their ideas into law. The most extreme political party inside our parliament. The Greens are in charge. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. A serious danger to Australia. Well, this here is an official Greens podcast <laughs> that you're listening to, Serious Danger. It's 100% real and legit. Bluetooth verified. We are, we are Bluetooth verified. I'm Tom Ballard. That is Emerald Moon. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining us and listening to the show. We talk about green politics in Australia and is made possible with the help of the Green Institute and our producer, Michael the Griff Griffin. This week, we are chatting about filthy populism. Got an amazing article to share with you <laughs> and to really dissect. I cannot wait. 
And we are going to be looking at the register of interests of the brand new members of the 47th Parliament. Woo-hoo. Some treats in there. Some quick housekeeping. You can rate and review this show on Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media at Serious Danger AU on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Like us and subscribe on YouTube, please. Like we would really appreciate subscribe. that. Like and subscribe. Head to SeriousDangerPod.com for all the details. Or you can become a patron, Emerald. Mm, I would love that. I would love that if you became a patron. We have a few new people who are patrons. Rattle them off very quickly. Thank you, Annalisa, Head Kittens. I, I recognize that <laughs> from uh, Twitter. Daniel, mm-hmm. Rebecca, Robin, Nick, Arlo, Cass, Alec, Robin, Sai, Rowan, Dolores, Stephen, Peter, Emma, Laura, Laura, Len, Brendan, Holly, LW, Megan, Jake, Beck, Annie, mm-hmm. Stella, Tim, Alan, Julia, John, Jonathan, Kat, Robert, Samantha, Stephen, Claire, Scott, Piers, John, Emily. God we got a whole damn. fucking party. And Kate, Kate Delace. Oh, and another one there. Kate and Neve. I'm just checking the email now. Welcome, everyone. Hi, welcome, welcome to the family. Serious Danger fam. Thanks for your support. Yeah, patreon.com forward slash Serious Danger. You, a whole lot of people signing up, I think, enticed by hearing our conversation with Will Anderson. Mm. If you join a pod- uh, as a patron now, you can listen to that and our entire back catalogue of bonus content. All of that helps us keep the lights on here at Serious Danger. And you can always email us too, hello at seriousdangerpod.com, like the lovely Zoe did last week. Just very quickly wanted to- I love this email. Nice, isn't it? Hi, Serious Danger folks. Just thought I'd send an email of appreciation across for all your content, but especially the most recent pod episode that was last week. I was one of the many people who initially felt annoyed and disheartened by the fact that the Greens voted for the climate bill. Listening to you both explain the context and reasoning behind it helped change my mind on the issue, and I now understand both why they did it and how it can further help the Greens movement. Big thanks to Tom, especially for clarifying the issue, and huge thanks to Emerald for the reminder that the Greens movement doesn't just stop on the hill in Canberra. It is so easy to get bogged down in the Canberra bubble and forget that there are so many other ways the Greens movement is working to help people on the ground. So cheers, Emerald, for the reminder. You're welcome. Oh, Thanks, Zoe. Do you feel like the party and the movement has generally processed and moved on in the past week in regards to the climate bill? I don't know. I, like, I'm really out of the... I'm almost too far out of the <laughs> Canberra bubble at the moment. I'm in the Queensland politics bubble again, so right. we just... It's not... <laughs> Does make a difference to us. We still got our, our um. What's our fucking state government target? Is still like our state government target is still thirty percent. Still pretty much the same as the old <laughs> liberal federal government. So <laughs> you know they were popular. Please, it's all about popular. It's not about attitude. It's a regular view, so it's very true to be very very popular. Like oh, me. Does well, speaking to- of. The Greens in Queensland. (laughs) Let's get into this. Greens turn to populism to win my seat. Terry Butler. My seat. My seat. (laughs) Terry's chocolate orange. It's not Terry's. It's mine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this is a piece in the nine Fairfax papers by Latika Burke. Incredible photo, photo choice of Terry Butler accompanied. <laughs> like which photo editor do I need to send a bunch of flowers? <laughs> it's not even. How would you describe it? Well, so, you know, sometimes they do this a lot with like um, Anastasia Palaszczuk, for example, where they choose like a really unflattering photo of the Courier Mail. It's not even, it's not that it's unflattering. It's just. Perfect vibes. So Terry Butler <laughs> is seated in the House of Representatives. You can see that she's sitting on her little green bench um, <laughs> and she's just looking slightly off, off camera. She's by herself and she just has the most sullen look on her face. <laughs> sullen is the, oat, like, so sulky. <laughs> That's 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 from when she had the seat, she right? This is before seat. when she she wasn't even happy then. That together with the most like sour and <laughs> you know tantrumly article, this yeah. photo is just brilliant. If you have any heart issues, I'd I'd stop listening now because the salt content uh, <laughs> over the course of this article and our discussion is pretty wild. And look, we're gonna have some fun with this specific case with Terry Butler, but it, it goes to a broader issue that I think is really interesting mm. and relevant to the Greens and what we want to talk about. So. Terry Butler has accused the Greens of resorting to populist tactics of the right wing to oust her from her seat in a stunning upset on election night. Butler was on course to become Australia's new environment minister until the Greens' Max Chandler Mather snatched her Griffith electorate (laughs) with a 10.9% swing to the party. Now, Emerald, why did Max snatch Terry's seat from her? I mean, that was very rude. We like to steal from women. (laughs) It's as simple as that, Tom. It's your mean girls. Yeah. 
A large part of his campaign was promising the suburban electorate he would address the aircraft noise from nearby Brisbane Airport with a curfew and cap on flight numbers. It was one of three Brisbane electorates where the Greens campaigned on aircraft noise. Butler says the party, the Greens, did not have the power to affect any change on aircraft noise if elected federally, but their campaign was a sign they have learned the populist lesson from right-wing movements overseas and are bringing them home. The real answers are complicated because they go to flight paths and distribution of noise, Mm. but a populist approach to campaigning on those issues is really just about the attribution of blame, she said. It's the tactic of finding divisive issues, campaigning on them, and providing ostensibly simple solutions to complex questions. Mm -hmm. So complicated. So much going on here. So during an election campaign, it is better to blame no one for problems, don't identify an enemy, avoid all divisive issues, like anything that might differentiate you between somebody else. Politics is about everyone just like thinking the same thing. Yeah. And you should offer no no solutions to any of those problems. No, well, that would be oversimplifying it. This is like one of my biggest core critiques of of politics, I think. And I may have said this before on the podcast. I've said it in various places that the biggest thing that I learned when I like over the last few years getting involved in politics is it's not as fucking complicated as they like to make out. (laughs) And it is one of like. (laughs) <laughs> the the greatest tools of the political establishment, like, is yes. to say that things are more complicated than you could possibly ever understand, and so you should just disengage. Yep. And anyone offering you a solution is is simply lying to you. It's a, yeah. complicated. Usually means there are competing interests involved. Yeah. And we'd have to go up against some of those really powerful interests. Normally, people with shitloads of money, and we don't want to do that. Yeah. So that's so it's too simple for us mm. to just. But do instead, that. they sell it as yeah, we understand it because we're we're very smart, but you and your small brain could never understand. So just trust <laughs> us that we're doing the best that we can. So just really quickly, because I, I do think it, it's handy to have like tangible examples when we're talking about this. And, Ter- and Terry Butler has identified the aircraft noise issue as the, the most egregious example, apparently, of populism by the Greens. But just really quickly, you know, the Brisbane airport opened a billion dollar parallel runway in July 2020. It's got all these new flight paths. It is a 24 hour airport, which I didn't know before researching this. So, you know, most airports have a curfew normally about 10 p.m. to to 6 a.m. in the morning. Brisbane, 24-7 people flying in and out. Sometimes they fly in over the bay, which is obviously less distracting Mm. than flying over people's houses, but um, a whole bunch of them do. It pisses a lot of people off. Air Services Australia was found in a report to engage effectively with people and like do consultations. It seems like the whole process has been pretty shit. And the simplistic populist approach that Max Chandler Mather was running on was basically saying, well, we should have what Sydney has, which is a 10 p.m. curfew to 6 a.m. in the morning and to try and plan ahead so that more flights fly in over the bay and don't Mm. fly over people's houses. And potentially a cap on flight numbers. Uh, Right. So, yeah, it'd be like 45 flights an hour. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, I guess it's like easily digestible. These are basic solutions. It won't make the, the world perfect and they're not asking for, for the world here whatsoever. They're pointing to other examples like Sydney and International Airport and saying, why can't we have what they've got? Why do we have to be 24 hours of 24-7? Um, but apparently that is that is just too that's too populous. It's basically Trump or Bolsonaro. Yeah, yeah, very Trump-esque. Many, many people are saying this. <laughs> Terry Butler said, uh, Labor would establish the existing community forum as a permanent and independent community voice. So there's already a, a voice, a, a community voice there that isn't obviously powerful enough to do anything about this issue. She said the government's, this is during the campaign, has been hopeless on the issue. We want a permanent standing community forum with real teeth, not something that is underneath the Brisbane Airport Corporation, but with a direct ear into the infrastructure department and therefore the minister. Uh, Something about direct ear to the noise from the flights. (laughs) I'm working on it. I'll let you know. (laughs) <laughs> our, our minister can't hear you because his ears, he's gone deaf from all the airport noise. Yeah. That is what we will deliver. Nothing would change under the Greens party because they can't get anything done in Parliament. Mm. Now, now, that's not divisive, by the way. Just shitting and lying about your political opponents and just like saying that, you know, they're lying to you, they'll, they'll fuck you over. That's not divisive populism or anything. Mm. That's just that's just sensible stuff. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah, it's a bit confusing. Like, is, is she just using populism and division interchangeably in this article? Well, well, the worst thing is divisive populism. Okay, divisive populism. Is populism inherently divisive? Uh, Yes. Arguably. It divides us into us and them, but we'll get to to that when we talk about the definition. But a Labor spokesperson told the ABC that Labor would commission a new white paper. Oh, (laughs) fucking hell. Which would take a detailed and coordinated look into national aviation policy. I cannot understand how she (laughs) lost her seat. 
I'm so inspired by this. It is against <laughs> introducing an airport curfew. And I mean, you've got it right there, right? Like, so it needs to be simpler. Like, like it's too, it's really complicated, this issue. Mm -hmm. And so we need to propose really, really complicated solutions mm -hmm. that won't actually address the problem. And I, as an elected representative, can't go out there and sort of like listen to what people want and say, you know, this is what we want. This is, a, this is our, the thing that we want to fight for to make yeah. people's lives better. Can't do that. Needs to go through the white paper consultation community mm -hmm. three-year process. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to make sense. Yeah. After, like, by the way, the Griffith campaign, Brisbane campaign, like they did intense, thorough community consultation. They worked with the Brisbane Community Flight Path Alliance, which is like a resident group that was campaigning on this. They held forums, you know, all, all of that um, and knocked on thousands of doors, which I personally, when, I, when you're knocking in, in Griffith, you would be having a mm. conversation and suddenly you wouldn't be able to hear each other because the fucking planes were so loud. Like it was very, yeah. very stark. So, yeah, they ha did that consultation and then put forward solutions it's just that, mm. yeah, for some reason, Labor didn't want to get to that, that step of proposing the solutions. Back to the article this, this week. Butler said it was not immediately clear how Labor could combat left-wing populism, but restoring public confidence in political institutions was key. Unless you have confidence in institutions, then you are going to continue to get not just anger, but anger that's coming from a place of exhaustion, she said, arguing that these voters would look for people who will just provide a simple answer. So the problem is not the institutions themselves and how they've actually failed people and have clearly demonstrated that they don't give a fuck mm. about ordinary people, that they can't function properly, they're all compromised by the influence and power of vested interests. Mm. No, the problem is our attitude towards those institutions. And if you critique them in any way or point out the way they're failing, well, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the actual problem, not the institution's actual performance at making people's lives better, you see. Yes. A wise level, uh, like a wise lesson to take from the declining trust in institutions indeed. Yes. Butler insists the result on election night was not just about individual seats such as hers, but about whether Labor had won a majority. On election this night- This is sad. <laughs> this is so sad. I- Oh, keep going. <laughs> On election night, we didn't know whether we'd won the seat or lost it, but my primary yes, emotion- you did, babe. You did. My primary emotion I, <laughs> was one of happiness and relief that was, we'd had a change of government. <laughs> this is literally me, like, getting dumped and being like, I- I'm happy well, about it, actually. What I was feeling was mostly <laughs> happiness. <laughs> Um, this is a, you know what this is actually the better. Other couples this is actually around better. Me. I'm yeah. actually, I mostly I'm just happy that other people are in love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Nah, good. I've got that's actually what I wanted. So it's fine. Yeah. It wasn't snatched out of our hands. That's victory. We have an Albert Easy Labor government and that's what I really wanted, she said. In a televote <laughs> interview to discuss her new role as chair of Circular Australia, a non-profit organisation aimed at speeding up the country's transition to circular economy practices. Oh, that's which, what the article was. Sorry. Yes, that's what it was. I, now I understand. <laughs> yes. I'm the head of the recycling factory. Let me tell you about how the greens are a pack of cunts. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Butler says she does not know if the party can win back Griffith, the seat held by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. She said the electorate had long been an outlier seat in terms of income and household wealth. If you have a look at the median house price in Griffith, it is way higher than the median house price of even the next most wealthy Labour-held seat. Is that true? That is not true. That is absolutely not true. First of all, it's a terrible take, okay, and just the idea that, yes, median house prices in our fucked housing market in any seat just means that, well, Labor couldn't have, she never could have won. She was never going to win. This was inevitable. Yeah, it was just going to happen. But also, like, that's the fucking, like, it, massively increasing house prices is one of the biggest <laughs> issues that the Greens campaigned on. It's so funny yeah. because, yeah, in her world, she's like rising house prices, which is good for the people who own the houses, completely yeah. forgetting about the renters <laughs> and the people who don't own the fucking houses, which is why you lost the seat, Terry. Yes, well, that's a very simplistic populist take. <laughs> Sorry. But looked it up, median house price in Griffith is about $1.2 million, pretty much exactly the same as Benelong and Higgins, which Labor both just won in this past election, FYI. Uh, the median house price in Grainler, currently held by our Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, $2 million. So she's not mm. even correct and Strange. somehow Labor MPs in 
uh, seats with higher median houses are still able to hang on to their seats. That's amazing. Shout out to at rip- Ripping Hot Takes for pointing this out on Twitter, ripping by the way. Take. Thank you, Ripping Hot Takes. <laughs> and the final <laughs> the final bit of saltiness to end this article, and then we'll talk about the you know bigger political scientific question. My sense of this election was that it's always harder and harder to win this seat. And if anything, we can be very proud of having it won three times since Kevin was the member without having someone who was the Prime Minister as the MP. Again, just like, I, you know, I did really great, actually, by holding it at all, by winning this seat. I understand. She said Chandler Matha had an advantage as the Greens, unlike Labor, did not observe a six-week moratorium on door knocking during mm. the Omicron peak in the summer before the May poll. I don't know if it even would have made a difference but I think it was morally the right decision of the party to put the moratorium on door knocking. Campaigning is an unfair advantage. It's it's really unfair. A spokeswoman for Chandler Mather said Max and his team spent those weeks delivering free food boxes to those stuck in lockdown yeah. while following health advice at all times. If Labor still hasn't worked out the real reasons they lost to the Greens, then they have some soul searching to do. Great. Do you know who that was? <laughs> do you, can we identify them or not? I don't know. Mm-hmm. It was Max's, like it was it was Max's team. Okay. That that came from, as I believe. <laughs> Did you hear any of that beforehand? Was there any talk about like was she? I salty didn't know that- this article was coming. No. Okay, right. But did you know that Terry Butler or Labor were angry at the Greens for handing out free food to people and thought that, that was cheating? Oh, during the, we uh, knew that they were trying to attack the that the Labor Facebook page or whatever that always would attack Max was going on and on and on and on and on about the fact that he was still like interacting with residents because yeah, right. he would like do community outreach outreach and deliver free food and supplies. Anyway. <laughs> How you can? Uh, I mean, I know some people did call off door knocking. Stuff. You can door knock safely. Yeah, we literally with got lots of you know vaccinated and masks and sanitizing and stuff. It's fine. I remember because it's not like we just decided to go ahead. We literally got health ad- got the health advice and analyzed yes. it and determined the like risk of door knocking in relative to other activities that were allowed during mm. the knock da- the lockdown and determined that the risk from door knocking in the way that we were doing it and we put like specific measures in place to minimize the risk of transmission like that right. it was yeah very 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 low risk well you cheated you, you, yeah you cheated. So we're big cheaters. that's not fair yeah the question of course that comes out of this article are just incredible work great work Terry, thank you, Latika Burke, for bringing this into our lives. Shout-outs to Circular Australia as well and all yeah. your fantastic work that I learned so much about sure in the course of this article. They're like, so, Terry, <laughs> how'd you go with the article introducing your new role? We're really excited to have this high profile. And she's like, yeah. Well, yeah. it ended up a little different. Um <laughs> I just I want her to have to have a meeting with the with the Greens MP. Ideally with Max. Yeah. I guess he's not environment, but it's just at some point that meeting's gotta happen. Yeah. Anyway, the question, of course, which I think is relevant to to us and comes out of this, is what is populism? Mm. And shout out to DJ Rob Sepp on Twitter, who again tweeted in response to this article, populism <laughs> is when somebody is more popular than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very true. But Emerald Moon, lay it out for us. What is populism in political science terms, what are we talking about here? I mean, I'm not a political scientist. I don't. You did that course. What course? That, that You know oh, that guy you're always talking intro about? Intro to you... politics, media and politics <laughs> 101, literally. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I did that. The fucking lecturer that delivered that predicted that there was absolutely no way that we could win Griffith, Brisbane or Ryan, so um, yes. I'm not sure why I would listen to him. Well, but he didn't know that you'd cheat. He didn't know yeah, that you were going to cheat. Yeah, I guess that so tree didn't actually- take that into account. I'm sure I could look through my yep. notes and find a definition for populism. The way I think about it, which is prob- I, I'm starting to think my understanding of populism is not the accepted definition in political science. I think mm. about it literally as just like doing what's popular, Quite like to, <laughs> to oversimplify it as Greens are want to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I mean, look, it is a loaded term and it has got to the point where it is just a bad thing. And clearly people like Terry Butler and people who came to her defence in the co- in the wake of this article think that if populism is bad across the board and if someone accuses you of, of being a populist, then you're bad and that mm. the Greens would deny that they are populist. And obviously we'll get to that in a sec. Mm. And, and, and you'll see contested definitions across the board. I've got mm. a few here. 
Peter Harcher from the Sydney Morning Herald, my preferred definition of populism is that it's a style of politics offering unworkably simple solutions to complex problems. Okay, so obviously That's the definition that Terry read. Okay. Yeah, yes, she's on board with that. Um, in political science, populism is the idea that society is separated into two groups at odds with one another, the pure people and the corrupt elite, according to Kaz Mudd, author of Populism, A Very Short Introduction. Okay. Okay. Dictionary says a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. So, and, and I really think that is the guts of it. You know, mm-hmm. it, it is it is a political strategy or political rhetoric, and the fundamental part of it is an us versus them. Yeah, it is the people versus the elites at the top. Yeah, right. And that can be that can take multiple forms. It can be left wing or it can be right wing. Mm-hmm. And so some examples, left-wing populists we would think about are the likes of, say, Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Those are the kind of figures we're talking about. Right-wing populists, your Donald Trumps. Pauline Hanson. Rodrigo Duterte, Pauline Hanson. Exactly. And that is kind of crucial because, of course, people, some people, at least the Terry Butlers, do not like that kind of populism because they think it is inherently divisive to frame political issues in, a, in, a, in the frame of us, the people, versus them, the elites. Yeah. And really the elites is like who you're, who you're pitting the people against, again, depends on that left-right divide. So if you're left-wing, the elites are capitalists, the yeah. people at the top, billionaires, millionaires, the ruling class. If you're right-wing, the elites are normally cultural elites, um, uh, bureaucrats, government itself, or indeed not even elites, but, you know, um, immigrants and sexual and gender minorities and the poor. Arguably, like particularly in the case of Trump, which I think is – often the first person that people think of when they think about populism because he did populism, right-wing populism so well, a lot of people would say. It goes even further and if you look at the groups that supported Trump, like QAnon, the elites are generally a a group of Jewish bankers or lizards or like that's, yeah. yeah. Tom Hanks. Yes, (laughs) celebrities that are secretly sacrificing children. Yeah. I people might if people listen to all the leftist podcasts they might have recently I think it was last year Thomas Frank was doing the rounds of his new book so he's an, an American academic he's the one that really sort of you know turned a light bulb on my head for, for this kind of stuff he's written two books people without power the war on populism and the fight for democracy and the people uh, and and the people know a short history of anti-populism okay so he knows his shit uh, he's a leftist he writes great stuff about you know critiquing how shit the Democratic Party is but you know this this political tradition, and, and it, you have to tie it to actual political history and the way that populism has played out in politics across the world. You know he's he's looked into this very specifically. He's from Kansas, and it really dates back to the 1890s when a group of Kansas farmers got together and declared themselves to be the populist party, and it basically became a left wing. He he writes a left wing flowering that happened across the world. It was the American equivalent of labor parties and social democratic unions springing up in other places. Populism, as its inher- adherents saw it, was a fine and hopeful thing, a mass movement of farmers and industrial workers demanding action by the government to improve the economic situation of ordinary people. And while they're at it, a war on corruption as well. The Greens. <laughs> It was the Greens. The Greens were invented in Kansas in 1890. And so it really gets, yeah, so interesting when you get into the nitty-gritty about what people think it is and whether it's good or mm. not or bad or not. So for me, the, salu- the slogan that Jeremy Corbyn had uh, when in 2017 and indeed Adam adopted, Adam, I believe, yeah. in the 2019 election, for the many, not the few, is a populist Slogan, yeah. right? You are you're clearly dividing society into two into two camps there by your analysis, and you're saying yes, we should our our society should be um, geared around the masses and what's good for most people, which is broadly defined the working class, not this tiny few of people who hoard an extraordinary amount of wealth and power into their into their hands. Now, I guess technically you could be for the many, not the few, and sort of still subscribe to technocratic political solutions to stuff. But obviously, if you're getting excited about being for the many, not the few, as someone like Emma Dawson from the per capita think mm-hmm. tank who came to Terry Butler's defense here regularly has done, no, you're what? doing populism. You're still on board, right? Still on board, right, with the, the interests of the, of the many. Is that what you mean? I'm saying if you use that slogan, you're doing a little bit of left-wing populism, right? Yeah. It's, it's the, and left-wing populism 
is good. Yeah, <laughs> because it is left good. wing is good, right wing is bad. It's about well, and and that's the thing. Like my response, or I tweeted something that was obviously in reference to this Terry article that. When I see people going hard against populism, that that is what they take aim at is populism. I'm like, this is just a way of saying how much smarter and better you think you are than everyone because it it shows that to me you do not trust ordinary people to have the solutions to the problems that are affecting them. Like the, the, yeah, the many cannot be trusted to come up with solutions for their own lives. And like, that is what, it's exactly what we talk about when we're like, this is why we door knock differently because the Mm. whole point of door knocking is to hear what people are experiencing, what they think of the potential solutions, what they would like to see. And it's political education for our volunteers. We don't go out there going, we're going to explain to them why this is actually the solution that they need for their lives or this is what they should be caring about. Because, yep. and this is something that I think Max in particular says a lot and it underpins a lot of the the way that we campaign in the Queensland Greens is people are experts in their own lives. Yes, totally. And they know it. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's, it's a significant shift for the Greens in particular because we have a history of being a rather technocratic party. And we, yes. I, I even know some people, I'm not sure about this, but I know some people take issue with the term evidence-based. And we have this real obsession with all of our policies being evidence-based because what that yeah. often means is we go to the quote unquote experts, we go to, mm. um, you know, academics, we go to the, the people who have the apparent um, expertise in an area because they've studied it. And they're often from a political, uh, a particular class and we take what they say are the solutions and we say we adopt them as policy and it's Mm. like maybe those experts have not actually they don't have the lived experience of the problems that they're proposing solutions to and we should be treating ordinary people the many as the experts yeah totally i mean to me the the prime example is privatization right so privatization is solution come up with by exactly Mm. by economic experts and media elites and the political class and even now, you know, what are we, 30, 30 years into the mass privatisation project, uh, started by the Labor Party in the 80s and 90s, selling off public assets like Commonwealth Bank and Qantas, and at the state level, a whole bunch of people selling off electricity grids, public services and utilities, public transport systems. Still, the opinion polls make it very clear that people fucking hate it. They know what it's like living in a society in which so much is privatised. Yeah. They People know that massive private companies are trying to rip them off. And yet the political class's response is always like, no, no, this is actually better for you. This is actually good. Yeah. We know better than you do um, about about how your life works yeah. um, and and how what, what a good society looks like. Like, trust us, you, we, we actually know better than you do. It's fucking crazy. We get this and that's we get it. Like it often comes from green supporters. I think like older green supporters talk about this thing of not doing what's popular but what's right Mm. as though those things are always going to be in opposition to one another and it's I I think you know we spoke about this in the conversation with Will Anderson about that that Greens ad on the Gruen transfer that was about you know if you think you vote Greens because Mm. if you're smart you understand that our policy that are the right ones but I mean, in, in a situation where you, the Greens would be getting less than 10% of the votes, kind of assuming that 90% mm. of the population is stupid, um, yeah, yeah. when in reality it's probably a sign that we hadn't uh, hadn't adequately communicated to them or listened to them and, and proposed the solutions to the problems in their lives that make sense mm. to them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's that, you know, I know Simpsons memes aren't funny, as Tom Tanaki says, and I kind of agree, but it's that <laughs> fucking Simpsons screen grab that it's like, Am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. And it is always no, it's the voters who are wrong. Right. Emma Dawson tweeted, the Greens use left-wing populism in the same way as right-wing populists. Identify a divisive issue, foster a politics of grievance, promise facile solutions they know they can't deliver. It's irresponsible on both sides. It's irresponsible because it fosters division and anger, gives people false hope, and undermines collective faith in institutions and democratic processes. If you deplore populism on the right, then you can't applaud it on the left. And this this fucking drives me nuts. Yeah. 
False hope. We are not fostering are not the problem. Possible. People are fucked off. People are angry, okay? We are pointing out the, the truth, the actual reality yeah. of what life is like. We're not, we're not, you're not knocking on people's doors and saying, you're actually angry about everything. Yeah. It is actually, They're it is recognising their anger. Yeah. They're telling and us instead of saying, as a party. Don't be so shit. Like instead of, yes. you know, yeah, being ca- like calm the fuck down yeah. and stop hoping or, or wishing or asking for anything better, we go, yeah, yes. a better world is possible. But Emma right. Dawson is using that. It's on the fucking bingo. It's on the bingo card. It's on the tea towel. <laughs> better things aren't possible. Yeah. And just, it's like, yeah, all based down around, around rhetoric, right? So, mm-hmm. like, yeah, divisive rhetoric. It's like, no, capitalism is divisive. Capitalism yeah. divides us up into different classes and pits us against each other and concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a tidy few. That's We're just, we're just calling the shots as we see them. Talking about that doesn't, you know, if anything, raises class consciousness, which should be part of the left-wing project. And, yes, that's going to involve a fair bit of anger, when you actually seriously start to think about how much ordinary people are getting ripped off to the benefit of the few people at the top. So, of course, like, of, co- of course, keying into that is a political strategy that works, that, that, mm. that is clearly speaking to people and clearly spoke to people in Griffith. Mm. But we had people, like, at the same time, I saw there was someone on, on Twitter, Benjamin Moffat, who I hadn't heard of, but apparently has written three books about populism, which he said yes. in his tweet and also in his bio it says author of three books about populism. Um, and he was saying that the Greens don't do I populism. I mean, we've, ri- we've written no books about I've populism. I've written no books about fair. populism. So he probably knows more than me about populism, but I don't know that he knows more than me about the Greens and their campaign strategy. Um, he was like, the Greens did not do populism. And someone said, why do you say that they didn't? They didn't go left populist. He says, I don't think they see the people versus the elite as the core divide in society. They don't resort to, quote, unquote, bad manners or performances of the low. I'm, I'm interested to know what that means. And they are by and large technocratic in outlook. There's little that makes me think of Podemos, Syriza or Evo Morales looking at them. And then he included this quote from Max's article in Jacobin a few years back Mm. where he's talking about the success in the state election. And it says, unlike left-wing electoral strategies in Europe and the United States, the Queensland Greens approach isn't premised on a sudden populist surge. Instead, since 2016, the plan emphasised patiently and consistently building a movement capable of reaching people, primarily through face-to-face conversations. And I, I explained to, to Ben, like I, I replied and I said, I think you misinterpreted this. The emphasis there yeah. is that this isn't just a sudden one-off win. It's about the yeah. fact that this is something we've been building for many years, similar to how people saw the, the result in 2022 and go, what, this happened? It came out of nowhere. And we were like, no, right. it fucking didn't. But it almost yeah. feels as though he just kind of like word searched Queensland Greens populism <laughs> and ca- found this article and was like, see, he said it's not populist. When, yeah, like I, I know for a fact that most of the people involved in the Queensland Greens project would say it probably is populist intentionally. Yes, and that's good. And I'll tell you who else did a bit of article searching is Terry Butler. In the course of a thread, she said this is how, so when people are saying the Greens aren't populist, because, again, some people are thinking the, the populism is bad, <laughs> she tweeted this is how they described their own campaigning approach in a 2020 interview. Their populism is self-confessed. Ooh, and this is, a, again, it. <laughs> cool, gotcha, gotcha. This is from Max. The easiest voters we find to turn and flip are One Nation voters. Uh, and that's because for us, the divide in politics isn't left and right at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sound like a third wayist or like, you know, Blairite or, or you know, some like labour right freak. But um, <laughs> it's more that the divide in politics increasingly has become those who are in favour of sort of establishment politics and who have some sort of faith in the political establishment and there's a layer of Labor and Liberal voters who are like that. It's very small. And the vast majority of people who are increasingly, to some degree, on some sort of spectrum, quite anti the political establishment in some way, mm. frustrated with politics, fed up with politics. And so they've become separated from the political system. Yeah. And then Terry tweeted after that, when the Greens party self-identify as the left-wing equivalent of One Nation, it's pretty reasonable to describe their point as populist. Sure. Now that made me... <laughs> Fucking furious. <laughs> <laughs> is this your fault, isn't it, Tom? It is my fault. I'm very familiar with that quote because it comes from an interview that I did with Max on my podcast that was then written up for Jacobin Great episode. a few years ago. 
it was a great app, mainly obviously because of Max, and I would really encourage people listening to this show to check out the full thing because yeah. read, I read back over it in preparation for this. It is so fucking good, and I'm so glad that guy's in Parliament and he's bang on across the board. And what is, and if you read the full quote mm. of Max is talking about there, which Terry very conveniently left out of uh, of her twi- of tweets, he's talking about again, yes privatization, how fucked off people are with the status quo and tells the story of talking to a guy on on the doorstep, a guy who said like, oh, I don't think you're going to like me. I think Tony Abbott was too left wing. Okay, that's how he opened their interaction. Max then goes on to have a conversation with this guy and he reveals he was a boilermaker. He was a member of his trade union until the 80s. He felt betrayed by Labor. He told me the privatization of essential services had been a mistake. I agreed, saying multinational corporations shouldn't be dodging tax. I mentioned the need to bring dental into Medicare, which he thought was a great idea. He ended up agreeing to vote Greens this time. So, again, illustrating the connection that, that you know, the ideological underpinnings of the certain people have and being able to talk to them, connect with them, Make the case to them, bring them over to the Greens' vision of the world from, yes, even One Nation voters who apparently Terry, Terry Butler doesn't want their vote, like, fuck those people. Like, <laughs> like just as someone voted for One Nation once and then they're the worst people in the world and they shouldn't be connected with or cared for as part of social solidarity or as part of her politics. Um, that's what Max is fucking talking about. That is mm-hmm. actually what is winning. Uh, the green seats in in Queensland and hopefully across the rest of the country, right? Yeah. And this is the thing. I saw someone furiously retweeting, like quote tweeting my tweet and there were, they were very mad. There were a lot of tweets in this thread. They were having a go at me, but from the left, I think what they were, were saying was the problem with saying that populism is good or like a pro-populist mm. perspective is that it minimizes the harm done by, you know, actual racists, like the the people that, that One Nation might be targeting, for, for example. It, it ignores the fact that working people can be homophobic, can be racist, can s- cause serious damage. And it's sort of like the, the conversation that I was having with Jim in the episode where we were talking about um, homophobia in, in football, that it's like we don't want to excuse that just because there is a structural reason that people might be doing that. But I, I think that's the thing, like, we're not necessarily, we, we don't want to just be venerating the working class to the extent that we say they are, that they're flawless, that they are I- inherently pure, that nothing that they do is wrong, that whatever is popular is necessarily right, even if for structural reasons, racism is popular, homophobia is popular. Like, we, yes, mm. that causes real harm. And so that's the thing. I don't think that populism is a measure on which to judge a government or a policy necessarily once it's already been formed. Because then we could just say that, sure, if the LNP win the government that represents the wishes of of Australia and so that's populism and they're right. No, there are structural reasons that that has happened, but mm. it's the anti-populism that assumes that it will always be wrong that's my problem. Yeah, no, I really think that you've we've got to come back to the rhetoric of pitting the masses against an elite as being crucial to the populist idea, at least as, as I subscribe it. Because if, if it's mm. just doing whatever po- whatever's popular... I mean, yeah, you you will end up doing horrible, horrible shit. I mean, if you want an example of doing whatever's popular, look at the fucking Labor Party running a, a focus group on every single fucking issue, right? Like, wow. it, you know, not actually standing for anything and believing in stuff and just saying, well, we, or we can't do that because it's not popular, a justification often wheeled out uh, by the Labor Party defending their most horrendous shit. You can still have left-wing principles and stuff. They go into those things not actually wanting to know that if they proposed a leftist solution, would it be popular? They go into looking at for a justification to propose a solution that upholds capitalism. Like yes. I, I think that, yeah, all I really, what I'm really trying to acknowledge and kind of warn against is, as you said, that quote at the start, when we're looking at defining populism, Cass Mudd, mm. who said that it's pitting the pure people against the corrupt elite. And it's right. it's true that, you know, not the people aren't always 100% pure, but no. there's a little more of a nuanced uh, kind of, understanding that we can have for why that might be and how we can improve it, I guess. I'll, li- I'll put a link in the show notes. People should really read Thomas Frank's opinion piece on it and he knows this stuff. Particularly his, he's also, again, that second book is, is about the history of anti-populism, okay? Mm. And so you have the initial birth of populism, um, mass workers' movement in the, in the US fighting for economic democracy, all good things that 
you know, Labor people would would um, claim that Labor Party is all about. Then in the fifties, there's this sort of academic turn when when all the academia sort of gets really suspicious of this mass decision making, and the people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And academia really turns around and says, no, populism mm. was bad and stupid, ignorant and racist. Okay, and then that sort of has never gone away. And he describes it as like this anti-populism sentiment coming from the professional managerial class who basically want to protect their own interests and sort of say, no, you know, serious policy issues should be decided by elites, by them, who by the experts who know everything, technocratic experts mm. who have done, have done all the reading and written all the reports and simplistic solutions like tax the rich to fund services or mm. don't privatise everything or... I mean, the idea that putting dental into Medicare is like just some easy, simple, you know, simplistic, ridiculous solution that, that's completely unrealistic is crazy. But it's, as Adam thing. says, it's just putting line items in the existing yeah. Medicare system so that people can, who need the medical care that they need on their teeth can do that without going fucking broke. Yeah, because as Max says, the greatest tools of the political establishment is low expectations. Yes. So they really go, if it sounds good, it must be wrong. If it sounds simple, <laughs> it must be stupid. Like, that's it. Yeah. And once again, came through a pandemic in which free care, childcare was free. People were lifted out of poverty immediately. It happened. It could all happen. It's all a political choice to keep people. Better things are possible. They are. Final quote here, and then we'll move on, I promise. But this is Lee, McLauch- Lee McLaughlin writing in Jacobin where he writes about uh, the history of po- populism. He's writing about Scott Morrison in the populist frame and has clearly read Thomas Frank's work, and I thought this was incredible. According to Thomas Frank, the ALP was once so inspired by US progressive populism that its leaders considered calling themselves the People's Party. (laughs) (sighs) But they didn't, Everald. They didn't do that. And now they're tweeting at us, telling us that (laughs) populism is bad. That's the history of the Labour Party. Thanks, Tom, for talking so long about populism. (laughs) Um, So long, in fact, that we have run out of time to look at the register of interests, but we still want to do it. We can't fit it in this episode, but we're going to do a little bonus Patreon-only episode. We swear we didn't plan this. This isn't like us <laughs> trapping you into subscribing. We simply ran out of time. There's too much to say. But if you are interested in us going through the weird and wonderful world of the Register of Interests uploaded so far for our members of the 47th Parliament, head on over to Patreon and we'll have a little uh, now, extra combo there. I mean, be careful because, like, we'll probably be making fun of these rich ruling class fucks and all the stuff that they own, and that's... Mm. Very That's populist, pretty populist, divisive, simplistic. Um, call to action, some quick things around the country. If you want to get out there on the streets of the real world and uh, try to make the world a better place, the Refugee Action Collective is having a Let Them Stay rally on Wednesday, August uh, the... <laughs> you haven't put a date in. <laughs> Wednesday, August 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the link in the show notes if you want to go along. I, you know, refugee activists who are out there every cu- fucking couple of weeks, you know, giving direct assistance to people mm. who are locked up and tortured in our system are heroes, and any support you can give them would be fantastic. So that's just in Melbourne, obviously, uh, the Victorian Refugee Action Collective. If you're in Manchin, Brisbane, the Queensland Greens Raise the Age Bill is coming back for debate on Tuesday evening. So this is a bill to raise the age. For- of criminal responsibility from 10 to 14, get 10 to 13-year-old children, literal children, out of prisons Mm. and watch houses in Queensland. Um, Looks like the major parties probably won't support it because they're fucking evil, but we will be showing up Mm. outside of Parliament on the morning of Tuesday. I'll be there from 8 a.m., quick snap rally, bring a sign, bring, bring a picture of yourself when you were 10 years old to show how ridiculous that it is that you could be locked up under Queensland law and help us send a message that the community wants to raise the age. So outside Queensland Parliament, 8 a.m. till 8.45, Tuesday the 16th. Again, it's just, it's very simplistic to just say don't put kids in prison. Yeah, no, you're right. I should rethink that one. What about Monday to Thursday they're imprisoned and the, mm. but then they get the weekend off? Yeah, yeah. No, that's honestly, we are probably going to literally get that sort of response from from Labor. What if only for certain crimes? What if they can go to certain <laughs> kind of detention centres but not other ones and only at certain ages? God. 
Um, final one, if you're in at WA, we don't do a lot of shout-outs and stuff in WA, but Extinction Rebellion are organising this Perth Stops for Climate rally. But this is interesting. It's a critical mass rally. So the idea is that they get heaps of people to register for the rally, then they determine when it's happening and when it's on so that they've got like this huge amount of people you know, just call the rally is and that hope populism? that lots of people rock up. They do it if people are interested. <laughs> it's all populism. <laughs> it's popular. They got to find out if it's a popular. Yeah. Um, it's so it's an action network um, register. You can say yes, I'm in Perth and I would come to this rally, and then they'll figure out. You know, once they get sort of reach this critical mass of shitloads of people, then they'll you know de- uh, identify the time. It'll be a Monday morning kind of thing. But yeah, link in the show notes if you're in Perth and you want to come out and have a massive, massive rally to demand climate action, to say that, you know, things like the Scarborough Gas Project, which will kill us all, shouldn't happen, then register for that critical mass rally. I think that's a cool idea. Thanks, WA comrades. Until next time, we'll see you on the Patreon or we'll see you next week. Fuck the elites. Yay, the people. Bye, you little populist bastards. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we should have plugged, uh, you know, Circular Australia. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Great work they do. <laughs>